Compact and bijou are the key words this week as On the Ledge delves into the world of tiny plants. I'm Jane Perrone, your host, and I'm joined this week by Leslie Halleck to talk about her new book, Tiny Plants. Plus, I answer a question about a colourful Tradescantia. Thank you to Alison, who became a crazy plant person this week and supported me on Patreon, and Cherie, who became a super fan. And also, I must give a shout out to Inga17494 in the Netherlands, who left a lovely review for the show. And I heard from Lynette, who was listening back to an old, an old, old episode, actually. I think it was episode 26 off the top of my head about old houseplants. And she shared the story of her night blooming cereus, aka Christ in the Manger, that's Hyla cereus undatus for any botanical Latin fans. It sounds amazing because the cutting that her dad had was from his grandmother. So the dad was born in 1933, so you can imagine how old this plant is. And Lynette has passed on a cutting to her own daughter to keep the tradition going. And Lynette says, this plant is a part of our family history. How wonderful to still have it with you. And these plants can go on for decades. It's so lovely to know that it's continuing to bring you all great joy. And yeah, wouldn't you just love to be able to have the magical skill of being able to touch a plant and a bit like Spock doing a mind meld, you could then access where it's been. Yeah, I think if I was going to have a superpower, that might have to be it, a sort of a A plant mind melt would be amazing, wouldn't it? But Lynette, thank you for sharing that with me. And if you've got any stories about old plants, I would still love to hear them. Speaking of which, it's coming up on episode 200 of the show. And this is a shout out. I would like to know from you for this episode, what has changed in the world of houseplants for you since February 2017? So maybe you have gone from zero houseplants to 200 houseplants. Maybe you have lost half of your collection because of an incident that happened during the pandemic. Maybe you've got really into Hoyas or spent a fortune on Aroids. I'd love to know from you how the world of houseplants has changed for you since On The Ledge started in February 2017. So you can just drop me a line to tell me this, or you can record a voice memo and send that over. Either way, the address is on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. Do not be shy. I love to hear from you guys. Don't think, oh, this is a shout out for other people who listen to the show. No, this is a shout out for you. Yes, you. So please do respond. This episode will be really rubbish unless I get lots of responses. So please, please, please record a little. It can be up to sort of two minutes long, but 20 seconds is fine. What's changed for you in the world of houseplants since February 2017? I need to know. You may remember Leslie Halleck from previous episodes of On The Ledge. She has joined me to talk about grow lights, for instance. Leslie is a Dallas, Texas based horticulturist and the author of many books on plants. Her writing is always science based and really well researched. That's one of the things I love about her. Plus, she's also a massive plant geek. So I was really excited to get her on the show to talk about her new book, Tiny Plants. And I started off by asking her how the book came about. Sure. I call it my origin story uh, with my love affair of uh, with tiny plants. Um, I did my undergraduate degree, my bachelor's degree in biology and botany. And I didn't have time to do an internship while I was going to college. So I, I wrapped up my degree and then took on an internship with the University of Puerto Rico. So which was amazing, because I got to go down to Puerto Rico, and be embedded in the El Yunque National Rainforest up at this little tiny research station way up in the mountains, you know, we, we couldn't get up and down ourselves, we were sort of sequestered there, me and a few
few other um, various plant researchers. And we were there to, to collect data and observe the effects of Hurricane Hugo, which had, had come through the rainforest in 1989 and completely defoliated the entire rainforest. Um, pretty amazing. So, of, of course, the University of Puerto Rico was looking at how does a rainforest regenerate from something like this? How does it, how does the natural environment come back? You know, and how is it different once it does? So I was there to work on that project. I was there for I think about four months, of course, through hurricane season, which was which was interesting. Um, but you know, it, but it was really one of the most wonderful times in my life because I'm sequestered in this beautiful rainforest, surrounded by nature, just trekking out in the jungle, taking data every day. Which, you know, I always tell everybody, um, you know, the happiest that I am is when you drop me off in some remote rainforest, jungle, forest somewhere, and I can just trek around and, and look for plants. It's a wonderful experience. So. One day, as I'm out in the rainforest in all of my uh, rain gear with my waterproof notebooks and pencils, uh, taking data on on the trees, we were specifically looking at tree regeneration. Huge trees, of course, in the rainforest. So I'm I'm focused on these, you know, 300 foot, uh, you know, huge tropical trees that took several of us, you know, reaching around with our arms to measure the the DBH, the the diameter of the trees, and I glanced over um, to a portion of the plot I was working in, and I just happened to see this little tiny speck of, of color, which is unusual because, you know, when you're on the, the forest floor in a rainforest, you're not necessarily surrounded by tons of flowers and color. You know, you're surrounded by trees and vines and a lot of greenery and a lot of decomposing leaves. But, you know, every once in a while you spot a flower, but this was so tiny. And I, so I headed towards this group of boulders and discovered to my um, utter glee a population of really tiny micro orchids, Lepanthes repestris. And the flowers are only about a millimeter or so. The leaves are about an inch, two and a half centimeters. And I just was utterly fascinated. I, of course, abandoned the work that I'm supposed to be doing and spend a bunch of time, you know, trying to get film photos, um, which in the rainforest, if you've ever taken a film camera into a rainforest, um, it can be a little bit tricky to maintain your, your, your photo film integrity. But um, I, that was it for me. That was sort of the beginning of my total obsession with tiny plants, all things tiny, really. But finding those micro orchids in the rainforest, uh, it, and in fact, that species only grows in that area. So it was a really unique find. That was it for me. I, and so after that, you know, I started collecting tiny plants. I started building vivariums for poison dart frogs and other herps. And of course, that's a situation when you're building a, an environment like that, you really have to get the plant species right. And so take a dive into vivarium building. Inevitably, you're going to find yourself surrounded by a world of itty bitty tiny plants. What a wonderful introduction to that you've given. You've really painted a picture there. Can you sort of explain what are some of the evolutionary explanations for why some plants just stay really, really small and, and get advantages from doing that? The predominance of very tiny, and we're talking genetically tiny plant species here, are a bit of a paradox, right? So if we kind of talk about the, our traditional understanding of, of botany and plant physiology, one would assume, right, bigger is better. You know, as long as there's enough water availability and sunlight availability, plants evolve to be bigger with bigger leaves, right? So they can collect more sunlight and grow bigger and dominate their environment, right? So that they can take up as many resources as possible. It's a, it comes down to competition. So it would seem logical um, that as plant species evolve, that we would end up with mostly large, not just large, but large leafed plant species. However, <laughs> the paradox is that Research is showing that very, very tiny plant species not only compete in terms of number of species in the same environments with large plant species, but often outnumber them. And so you think, okay, if bigger's better, if bigger leaves can collect more sunlight, right, and take up more resources in a space, then, then what's the evolutionary advantage of a plant species 
staying very tiny. And when I'm talking tiny, you know, we're talking, you know, um, a few, under a few centimeters, right? Very, very tiny species of plants. So there's a few different theories, right? And some are very obvious and, and some aren't as to the benefits, the advantages of being tiny. So why do tiny plant species still persist in the same growing environment under the same environmental conditions that very huge, you know, um, tropical plants or conifers exist. And a very simple, obvious reason is simply that tiny plants can fill up, they can multiply within the same amount of much smaller space, right? So they can pack more individuals, if you will, into a much smaller footprint, which means they can reproduce more economically, their tiny, tiny seeds can be produced much faster than larger seeded species, right? So they sort of have a competitive advantage in terms of space and speed. So that's re reproductive economy is what we call that. So that's one, um, you know, kind of more obvious um, thought process or theory as to why tiny plant species still persist from an evolutionary standpoint and, and maybe even are increasing in numbers uh, relative to larger leafed plant species. But then there's also a really interesting relationship um, which comes into play when you're thinking about how you care for your tropical houseplants. Um, and that is sort of the relationship between humidity water at the soil, root level, um, air temperature, and not only just air temperature, but cold temperatures at night. So it, something that many houseplant keepers might not think about is that tropical plants can actually overheat in the hot climates where they're endemic, <laughs> right? You think, well, these plant species grow in very hot climates, so that must be what they like. But they're able to thrive in those climates through really active transpiration, right? They're, they're cooling themselves through transpiration. And of course, you need lots of water to, to, to effectively transpire enough to cool very large leaves. But what big leaves with big sort of barriers of air around them are not good at doing is actually pulling heat out of the air. So as temperatures get more extreme, colder, right? So say you move away from the equator and night temperatures get very cold and maybe there's less water. A tiny leafed plant really has an evolutionary advantage in that it's able to stay warm, if you will. It can pull more heat from the air around the leaf. So it can survive in temperatures that are colder than a large leafed say, a tropical plant can. So there's all of these really interesting dynamics around not only just being efficient in terms of reproducing or using resources in a smaller amount of space, but tiny, tiny leafed plants are better at keeping themselves warm and potentially keeping themselves cool. Um, so that's why you usually see tinier leafed plants as you get farther away from the equator and temperatures get colder at higher elevations. So it's a really interesting phenomenon to, to look at the morphology of plants as the natural environment changes and to understand that it's not all about access to water and sunlight, right? It's also about the interaction with temperature and temperature extremes. So it's really fascinating. If you're into botany and you're into learning about how plants evolve, it's a, it's sort of an interesting emerging topic you can dive into. Well, that is really interesting. And uh, some of that I had never thought of. So that's really useful to kind of get that insight, Leslie. And I think one of the things that's confusing when people first get into houseplants is they go into a houseplant shop or a garden centre and they think they're buying a tiny plant for their terrarium. Mm. Uh, they're not buying a tiny plant, mm -hmm. they're buying a, a seedling, a young plant that's going to get much, much bigger. And this is one of the things that I think people get confused by. You know, they end up, they do a lovely job planting up a terrarium, but they've picked completely the wrong species because they're not actually tiny plants. And this is really where your book comes in, in terms of giving that information about what plants will actually stay small. But I'm guessing there's no real way other than knowing what species you've got just from looking at them in the shop, whether they're 
a tiny plant or a young plant that's going to get big? I, is that is that a stupid question? You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain that any better. <laughs> I actually address this in the book. I mean, there is a difference between naturally, genetically tiny plant species and artificially, um, you know, managed size when it comes to plants or just sort of age of a plant. Most of the plant species that you were getting at a at a traditional garden shop or online uh, in terms of of standard house plants, right? You know, you can buy a two inch, you know, um, you know, five centimeter or so pot, right, of something that's only, you know, the the, the height of your finger and you think, oh, this is going to be perfect for a terrarium. It's so small. But like you said, what you're really getting is just a very young tip, rooted tip cutting or a seedling potentially that simply hasn't grown to its mature size yet. And once you put it into that terrarium, you know, give it a year or so, and all of a sudden, it doesn't fit in that terrarium anymore. So and then there's also other artificial means to hormonally, chemically keep plants small. And you'll find this in the commercial growing industry for many ornamentals for, you know, garden annuals, um, for example, where growth inhibitors are applied to plants to keep them sort of small and compact, and then they'll grow, you know, once they grow out of that chemical application, all of a sudden, they're a much bigger plant than what you thought you were going to get. So my book, Tiny Plants, focuses on species that are genetically tiny and remain tiny at maturity. And that's the trick. So if you're actually trying to have a planted terrarium, you know, a standard size planted terrarium, you know, you're really going to have to be thoughtful about the species. And that's what it takes. You have to get to know what's the species that you're buying. Because just looking at something in a garden shop, just because it's in a small pot, does not mean it's a tiny plant species, does not mean it's going to be able to be sustained in a in a standard size terrarium indefinitely. So you're, it, you're absolutely right. But that's kind of an epiphany for people and one that they that's a connection they may not make until maybe they see a book like mine and go, oh, there is a big difference between young plants and genetically tiny plant species. Absolutely. You talked a bit bit about terrariums there. Tiny plants are great in terrariums. Why is a terrarium a great environment for a tiny plant? And can you give us some examples of things that do go well in a terrarium? Well, I, I want to give full disclosure that, that Tiny Plants is not a terrarium building book. So I want to be clear about that because there are so many great terrarium building books out on the market already. But what I do is introduce you to tiny high humidity plant species that you can plant directly into a terrarium or simply grow as potted specimens under any type of glass, be it a Wardian case, be it a cloche, you know, be it an up upturned glass canning jar, you name it, growing under glass, be it a planted terrarium or simply a a specimen placed um, under glass, can actually be a very low maintenance way to keep a pretty sizable collection of cool species of plants that, you know, might be more challenging for you out on the windowsill in terms of regular watering, right? So it's a little bit counterintuitive. Planted terrariums can be a little bit more complicated in terms of making sure that you build the drainage layer properly and you're managing water inputs. But if you're growing tiny potted specimens with glass cover or, you know, set inside a glass terrarium or in a wording case, which is sort of my favorite way to do things, it makes caring for those plants incredibly easy. So if you are really wanting to enjoy collecting higher humidity species, ferns, microorchids, micropeperomias, um, little syningia, little tiny, you know, gisneriads that really can't make it out on the windowsill without a lot higher humidity, then growing under glass is the way to go. Um, but you really have to use plant species that stay tiny if you hope to maintain right? That collection or that display or however you've planted your terrarium, you have to use tiny plant species or they're going to outgrow their space. So I love growing tiny plants under glass because 
while some of these species might be perceived as some of the more challenging ones to take care of, once you put them under glass, they become some of my easiest plants to take care of. So it's really an interesting phenomenon. Tiny Plants with Leslie Halleck shortly, but now it's time for Question of the Week, which comes from the aforementioned Cherie, who became a super fan this week and wanted to ask a question. So why not, Cherie? Let's hear your question. It relates to a Tradescantia quadricolor, bought from a nursery, but now people are telling Cherie that it's a tricolor, and Cherie is asking Is this just a sales gimmick? If you want to have a look at the plant that Cherie bought as a quadricolor, please do take a look at the show notes where you'll find it under the Q&A section. And if you take the briefest of web searches, you will find that Tradescantia quadricolor. What is it? You'll be a bit confused because there seem to be two different plants being sold under this cultivar name. The one that Cherie seems to have is called Tradescantia fluminensis quadricolor. And it's got green and white striped leaves with what I describe as a pink flush to some of the leaves. Let's just count there. Green, white, pink. I think that equals three colors. I'm not sure where the fourth color comes in. Sometimes you will see that the pink sort of eases into purple. So perhaps that's why it's being called quadricolor. As far as I can find from my research, and let's be clear, the Comilinaceae family that Tradescantia is part of is a bit of a mess taxonomically. <laughs> I say this about every single family of plants that I name. It's, it's a confusing business, this business of naming plants. But anyway, the spiderworts, Comilinaceae, they are in a bit of a mess. I think that the horticultural trade makes things worse because they tend to sell things under names that have been kind of given to the plant um, without due process of, of taxonomic research. So you get yourself into this problem where two different plants are being sold as quadricolor. Presumably they're selling this quadricolor that is under the Tradescantia fluminensis species as a separate thing from what I've always thought of as quadricolor, and which is the one that you'll find in the books, such as it is, is Tradescantia zebrina quadricolor. This is the one that I would recognize and call quadricolor. And if you see pictures of that plant, you will see clearly that it has four colors. If you get a nice specimen of this, you will see that it comes in creamy white, green, purple and pink colouring. And it really is quite different from the plant that's being sold as Fluminensis quadricolor. I found a couple of good sources of information on this particular dilemma. There's a website called Comilinaceae dash plants dot blogspot dot com. I will link to that in the show notes, which has a lot of information about cultivars that are being sold under incorrect names and so on and so forth. What that website does tell me is that quadricolor refers to zebrina, not fluminensis. Any Tradescantia nomenclature experts, please do get in touch and help me out with this. But that's what I have grasped so far. There's also a good guide to Tradescantia cultivars on the premiersucculents.com site. Again, I will link to that in the show notes. But I think what I would say, Cherie, is that yes, as far as I know, the plant that you've got looks like it has been labelled taxonomically anyway, incorrectly. We've seen it before. I've mentioned on the show that uh, there's a certain plant called Streptocarpus Pretty Turtle being sold by many outlets here in the UK, which has come from a Dutch nursery. And it's not a Streptocarpus. It is a Primulina 
this does happen. And I think this may be what's happened in this case. This quadricolor cultivar name has been attached to a plant from a different species just because, oh, it's quite colorful. Uh, whereas actually, it's not quite the plant that uh, should be called by that name. Isn't this confusing? I wish this didn't happen. But I would say that you've got a beautiful plant, Cherry. Enjoy it. Love it. A lot of money and time is spent buying quadricolor the one that I would call quadricolor, the Zabrina quadricolor, they are quite expensive. And yes, they are glorious, but I would say that all Dradiscantias can look absolutely amazing. They're an easy plant to look after, but they're a difficult plant to make look really good. You have got to put some work into it in terms of keeping it well fed and watered, pruning and keeping it from getting too lanky. And just to confuse matters further, the picture on the RHS website, which that supposedly shows Tradescantia zebrina quadricolor, looks very much to me like a regular Tradescantia zebrina. So nobody seems to be able to get this right at the moment. I guess it's not that surprising. A genus that's just so popular and has been bred and bred and bred. A lot of this stuff happens, which is, you know, it's a great way of marketing plants, but it's not necessarily that easy for those who want to be botanically accurate with their names. There's added difficulty because Tradescantias can really change their colours according to how much light they're getting. Like so many plants, they can take on a pinky purpley blush when they're exposed to more light. They can get paler, they can get darker, all down to light exposure. So getting to grips with what is what is tricky. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com and do include all the details you can. A picture is fantastic, as is info about where you're located and how long you've had the plant. And that kind of thing really helps me to answer your question accurately. Right now back to Leslie for more tiny plant chat. Let's talk watering. So in the book, obviously, I provide general, uh, quite a bit of general maintenance and, and care information. But I broke the plant profiles into two sections, which you'll notice. One of them is for the windowsill, plants for the windowsill, so open air culture, as I like to call it, and those for, for under glass. And essentially, these are broken up into these two categories by their water and humidity needs, if you think about it, right? So plants for the windowsill, tiny plants for the windowsill are going to be plant species that thrive in lower humidity and don't need as regular a watering schedule as as plants with higher humidity needs. And so you'll find that of the species that I have shown you for on the windowsill, even though they're tiny, they're actually relatively easy to maintain in terms of your watering schedule. Overall, tiny plants require much less resources, right? <laughs> less yeah. water. Now, some plants for the windowsill, container size is important, obviously, for, for all these plants. You have to look at the root system of the plant, right? Obviously, tiny plants are relatively going to have much smaller root systems, so you're going to need to be mindful about the size of pot that you use, maybe even more so for tiny plants than with standard size house plants, because it's very easy to rot a very tiny plant with a very small root system by planting it into something which you might perceive as small, like a four or five inch diameter container. That might seem small to you, but for a plant species that might have, you know, a, a root system that's less than, say, five centimeters or, a, you know, a couple centimeters deep that you can rot plants. So the trick that I start out with first when it comes to watering is be mindful of the type of container. You know, do a little bit of research into the root system of that plant so that you know how small or how big you can go. Here's one example. Um, have you ever grown lithops, living stones? Yeah. Succulent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can really vex a lot of people because they're very sensitive to water and they have a dormancy period. What's interesting about lithops is that they have a relatively large taproot and long taproot. So do pygmy sundews, which are the one of the tiniest plants I profile in the book, but they have a very long root system. So you might actually use a taller, deeper container for one of those very, very tiny plants because its root system dictates it. That's going to help you better manage that water. 
Now, tiny plants for the windowsill may require more frequent watering, right? Because they're in a tiny pot, it's going to dry out a lot faster than your standard house plants. If you are a habitual overwaterer, this is great for you. <laughs> because you can water more frequently and those plants are just going to dry out more frequently. So, you know, if you've got the species in a, in a size appropriate container, you know, chances are you aren't going to overwater it, <laughs> right? So that's kind of the benefit of, of some of the, 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 the tiny plants there. Now you go under glass and, and of course, you know, that, that changes a lot. But I find that certain species of tiny plants tend to be a little bit more sensitive to water quality. And I talk about that in the book. And also fertilizer. It's very easy to sort of burn your tiny plants um, much more easily. Um, so, you know, you're, you you want to look at maybe diluting um, your fertilizer even more. And I talk about that in the book. But, um, you know, little tiny squirt bottles, that's pretty much how I water most of my tiny plants. You know, don't try to water a, a tiny container with a standard watering can. You'll make a mess. So I love little squirt bottles, you know, so you can pinpoint water. And then... There's a couple of more unusual watering methods I mentioned. One of them is swamp watering, which kind of might be randomly new for a lot of people. Swamp watering is sort of, I, I guess I, I kind of equate that to sort of dangling your toes in the water, but not submerging your, your feet mm. or your legs all the way. <laughs> so for example, some micro orchids, or say you've got a kokodama fern or something that really is an epiphytic plant that really needs higher humidity or more regular water access to the root system, but submerging that root system under potting media or in LECA with water all the time will rot it. That's not going to work. So swamp watering is kind of my in-between approach where I will set the base of a mount that a, an orchid or a fern or something is on or suspend using fish line or something like that, the plant over a container that has water in it, but just dipping the tips of the root system into that water so that it's not submerging the root system. There's still a lot of air around the roots, but a few of the root tips have continual access to water. And I found this to be a really good strategy with certain orchids, or really any epiphyte that you want to mount onto something or that you want to suspend, you know, into a vase or an open air terrarium. It's reminded me actually of something that's come onto the market here in the last couple of years, which is houseplants mounted on, I guess it's lava rock yeah. and they're sold in a tray. I mean, like, you yes. know, me being cheapskate, I'm like, I could make that at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like you can obviously buy it as a whole setup, which is lovely. And, you know, obviously... Yeah. Lots of people want to do that, but it's the same kind of principle of that water being drawn up through the rock and the plant getting its water. But I, I, my mind starts worrying about ways that I could do that with my own construction. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of yeah. That's almost kind of a version of swamp watering because that that porous rock or other you know structure would basically sit in a little bit of water all the time. That's almost more like a wicking system. But mm. but those root tips will sort of you know grow down and sort of touch the surface of the water. So you get the best of both worlds. You get a little bit of continuous water access to to those aerial roots, but you aren't submerging them, which will quickly rot many of them. So yeah. it, it's sort of a good hybrid watering strategy. I, I see a lot of folks, you know, growing epiphytes, basically passively hydroponically, like in LECA, with submerged in water all the time, I think that can be a little risky because obviously you are not aerating those roots the way that they would like to be. So swamp watering kind of gets you the benefits of continuous moisture without submerging that root system. And anything that kind of allows you to sort of put some water in there and then go away without yes. panicking for a few days is a good thing. I, th I think that's uh, that's my take on it because I'm not an overwaterer, that's for sure. I'm very mean with the watering can. <laughs> so I am too. Uh, I really love those systems. Any system like wick watering where you can just leave things and let the plant get on with it is... Uh, is a plus as far as I'm concerned and has really actually allowed me to start 
growing some plants that I thought would I was just never going to get anywhere with. You'll see, uh, for example, the pygmy sundews or some of the other uh, tiny carnivorous plants I talk about. The ones that I feature don't need to be under glass in terms of humidity, but they're bog plants. And so you can just set those pots in kind of an inch of standing rainwater preferably. And so you you will you will note in in my book, Tiny Plants, I do talk about the fact that I do use collected rainwater for most of my itty bitty tiny plants and micro orchids just because it they respond better to rainwater. And with carnivorous plants, that's a pretty standard recommendation. But those can sit in open air culture, but in kind of an inch of water all the time. So it's sort of that same kind of kind of swamp watering situation, sort of a perpetual bottom watering, depending on their dormancy cycle. And people will always say, oh, gosh, I mean, how can you go on vacation with all these tiny, tiny plants? They're so sensitive. And I say, well, actually, most of my tiny potted specimens that are really kind of trickier are high humidity, and I just set them in glass jars, or I set a glass jar over top of them. Um, I love to collect vintage glass vessels, and you'll see a lot of those in the book. And that little potted plant just sits inside that glass vessel, and it can go weeks without you ever opening it or watering it. So it's um, can actually be a lot less stressful <laughs> when you leave and go away. And where do you pick these kind of things up? Is, is it sort of junk shops or auctions or? Yes, yes, and yes, <laughs> and, and yes, and online. But it's great because you're recycling materials, which is which is nice. So if you are trying to be a little bit more sustainable in your plant collecting, a lot of my tiny plants grow in little handmade pottery. I'm a big fan of, of, of handmade artisan um, pottery. So I look, I, I like to look for little handmade pots, but you can really recycle all sorts of vessels for tiny plants because, you know, I mean, you can grow syningias in thimbles, literally. So, I mean, you can recycle all sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, even vases, you know, even just plain old glass vases that, you know, have piled up from floral deliveries you may have gotten in the past, <laughs> you know, the, the clear glass is best, but yeah, I love going to vintage, like you say, you know, junk shops or, you know, antique shops, you can find a lot of really cool glass vessels in places like that. That sounds like a fun weekend activity, mm-hmm. just just right there. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm happy to indulge anyone's sort of obsession or new obsession on that. Or if you're looking for an excuse to, you know, add to your vintage glass collection, you're recycling. You're just being yes. responsible. You're being environmentally responsible. <laughs> well, here in the UK, we have something called the car boot sale. I don't know what, like people selling, you go into a field somewhere on a weekend, early on a weekend morning, and people have got like trestle tables set up outside their just outside their car and a car boot sale i can tell you is a really good place to go to get things like this because there's just all sorts there that you can pick up really cheaply so i don't know if you have that in the u.s but car boot sales are the (laughs) the other way to go i love that i wish we had car boot sales we sort of have um sort of crazy markets right like um, they're usually more sort of static Mm. you know they they're there's a location and you can go and um you know, antique fairs, things like that. Well, and I'm always looking for, you know, good glass domes, you know, that you can set on top. So, you know, that's the sort of thing I'm always scouting for and some of the larger domes. But I have also been gifted some of the the cutest, teeniest, tiniest little micro um, vessels and little that I have some of the teeniest, tiniest little cloches, you know, to sit. And, and you'd think you could never sustain anything under that, but... I keep a lot of micro syningia in incredibly tiny glass vessels and it's terribly satisfying. <laughs> I think syningia is a lot a long overdue a renaissance and in fact there are so many syningias. I just had a look on the Gesneriad Society seed fund mm-hmm. and the the syningia section is just it's it's enormous there's hundreds of them and I was thinking gosh I don't know where to start but I can imagine that's a whole heap of fun you just got to find the ones that are the micro cultivars or species as opposed to the larger ones. Yeah, the pusilla, the syningia pusilla, that's sort of your your classic micro species. There are a few other and then there are some natural um, varieties and a number of cultivars that are available. They can be difficult to find. So one of the things that I will say to folks is that you know, occasionally I'll get the comment, well, I wish you had covered more common species in this book. And my point is, well, then there wouldn't be a book <laughs> because <laughs> the whole point is, is that this book, Tiny Plants, introduces you to 
species that you you don't really know about. That's the whole point of it because tiny plant species like these are not at the forefront of the plant marketplace. You really have to dig around. You're going to find them with growers who grow for, you know, vivarium suppliers, you know, mm. um, for aquarium supplies. You know, you kind of have to go outside the normal plant shopping realm to find some of these. And that was the whole point is that I wanted to introduce people to a whole new realm of plant species they'd never heard of before, never seen before. What comes along with that is that you get to hunt a little bit more, which Personally, I find to be as much fun as growing the plants, searching and hunting for them, you know. So you just have to be willing to do a little hunting. But I love many of the the, the tiny gizneriads, the little tiny begonias, the little syningias, the little, you know, miniature African violets, the micros. I love all those. Well, with that in mind, can you just give us a few more species that are in the book that are some of your absolute favorite tinies? Yeah. So you were talking about uh, ferns. So, you know, you might give some of the little micro creeping ferns a try. Um, so my favorite for open windowsill culture, which, you know, there's not a lot of ferns that, especially tiny ones that you can just grow out on your windowsill or a desk. Creeping button fern, Pyrosia nimularifolia, is probably one of the easiest <laughs> to grow. It's pubescent. It's got fuzzy leaves. So it's able to hold on. It doesn't transpire as easily. So it's able to hold more moisture. And it's the cutest little thing. You can also grow it under glass and in a terrarium, but it's just as happy out in the windowsill or on your desk. So that's a favorite to go under glass, I love climbing snake fern. That's Microgramma heterophylla. So that's a really cool one. I am obsessed with micro orchids. There's a list in the book, but there are many genera you can get into. I would say Pleurotholis as a genus is probably the best place for a beginner to start with micro orchids because um, they're fairly free flowering and a bit more forgiving and easy to grow. They do need to go most of them under glass in an orchidarium, under a cloche, you know, mounted in a terrarium, something like that. Um, Vietnamese violets, I, I don't think get quite enough love. And if you struggle a little bit with African violets, that's an option. And pygmy sundews. I'm obsessed with pygmy sundews. They're about the size of your pinky fingernail. They're a little carnivorous plant, but they're relatively very easy to grow. And you can grow those out in open air culture. They don't have to go under glass. So, I mean, I can go on and on with lists, but <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a whole book. And here's the thing, and, and you know this because, you know, you're writing a book right now, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know this. Um, I've, I've written several books and it's um, – you, you get a size limit. You get a word count and a picture count. There's a size that they've sort of predetermined for the book, and you've got to fit everything you want to fit in in that space. A lot of people think that as an author, you write a book and you just write everything you want to write, and you feature everything you want to feature, and it's all going to go in the book. No, ma'am. Unfortunately, you're limited to scope and, and size, and so, I mean, I could have easily included many more plants that are featured in the book, but there wasn't space. So what I've at least done for you on each plant feature is I've also given a list of species that you can grow the same way. So didn't have space to get photos and features in for all of the plants, but for each species, you'll see that I've got an extra list of a bunch more things you can look for. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, uh, it's a treasure hunt. You can, you can be heading off and finding these things. I think that's a, a really fun element of it. And as you say, if they were available at every, uh, you know, supermarket, then we wouldn't be prizing them in the same way. I mean, those tiny sun juice sound so cool. Do, are, are they going to catch me some fungus gnats? Are they going to be useful <laughs> if they're, yes. if they're uh, uncovered? Actually, all of my carnivorous plants that I keep indoors um, are handy with the fungus net. They, they definitely help out. So in fact, I don't remember. I mean, I have pictures of my butterworts that have um, fungus nets trapped in them. And I don't know if there's a picture of that actually in the book. There might be. Um, but yes, they will catch fungus nets, which is a which is handy. Um yeah, so so there's there, there's all sorts of fascinating things that, that these little tiny plants will do. And and I tell you, it's there's nothing more exciting to me when than you know when one of my micro orchids actually flowers or my little syningias are flowering. I mean, it's just so fun. And if you 
are kind of running out of space, but you want to keep collecting, tiny plants are a great way to do that. If you don't have a lot of space to begin with, but you want to truly be a collector. You know, you want a few hundred species of plants in a very small footprint of space. That's what you get to do with tiny plant species. So once you've got your, you know, your snake plant and your Hartley philodendron and your, you know, and you've got these plants that actually get quite a bit bigger than, than most people realize when they buy that little pot at the garden center, um, I, I sort of wanted to give people a fun way to delve into a little bit more botany and be able to keep collecting even if they were kind of running out of space. <laughs> yeah, this is the point. Modern homes are just getting smaller and smaller, aren't they? And right. uh, certainly my house doesn't have, has very, very shallow windows ledges. So it's, it's having a small uh, plant that can fit on a tiny space is a massive boon. I mean, uh, I love my big monsters but actually they're a bit of a pain because they just get enormous so quickly so i can see the benefits yeah i think a lot of people you know really aren't prepared for that and then you know as new house plant keepers and so once you know it starts to get really huge and take over the space they go whoa you know i didn't really know this was going to happen and i will say (laughs) that the sort of the really handy thing and there's pictures of this in the book as well is that you know, with all of the new grow lighting technology, you know, that's out, most of the new grow lights that are out and available are LEDs that are sort of in that 20 to 40 watt range. You know, and I always have to break it to people that those grow lights are are really going to provide minimal supplemental lighting for many of your bigger medium to highlight plants. They're not going to sustain them indoors. It's supplemental. That said, for teeny tiny plants, which you can fit quite a lot of on a bookshelf, you can, you can provide really all the light that they need, you know, with about 20 watts per couple of, um, you know, square feet or, or a little bit less than a square meter. So 20 to 40 watts, which is the ballpark. If you really want to get into real light metrics, you know, you can go into my book, Gardening Under Lights, and I, I go into that there. But you get to use some of the really kind of nicer, prettier, low profile little LED bars that you can undermount in cabinets or bookshelves, which will keep groups of tiny plants very happy year round. That's another benefit. Yeah, you could have you could have a, a, a little shelving unit fit, fitted out with your LEDs and have a whole mass of tiny plants under there that would all be incredibly happy. Which which I do. I mean, yeah, I mean, who, who, who wouldn't love that? That sounds absolutely perfect, Leslie. Well, thank you for joining me today to talk about tiny plants. Um, it's been inspirational. As ever, at the end of an episode, I'm now thinking about all the tiny syringes and sundews <laughs> I need to go, <laughs> go and get. I'm happy to um, encourage your habit. I, I won't <laughs> apologize for that. Thank you for the kind words. I This was a little bit of a passion project for me. So I was happy to be able to put at least a little bit of my love for tiny plants. And like you said, a little bit of science. I, I want to always respect my reader and, and give, give a little bit of science along with the art. And that is horticulture, right? The art and science of growing plants. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks so much to Leslie for joining me today. And you can find out more about her book and see some images from tiny plants in the show notes at janeperone.com. Whether your plants are teeny tiny or several stories high, I hope they bring you massive joy this week. See you next Friday. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Kamiko, and After the Flames by Josh Woodward. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details. (laughs) 